I've aerated my lawn a whole bunch of times over the years and I've made a lot of video content about the process. Right now I'm preparing, I'm preparing to aerate my lawn again for the start of the spring 2024 season. I wanted to take this opportunity to do a deep dive into lawn aeration, how to do it, the different ways of doing it, the reasons that we do it, the time of year that we do it. And I wanna pull back all of that old footage, all of the old stuff that I've produced on this channel and give you a nice compilation. Everything you could possibly wanna know about lawn aeration is coming up in this video today. Hey, this is Brian. I run turfmechanic.com. And I wanted to talk to you today about aerating your lawn. Let's talk about how to core aerate a lawn today. There's a few different ways to do it. The most traditional way of doing it is grabbing a manual core aerator. There are a variety of manual core aerators. I use the Yard Butler. It's got two cores, two prongs. They're about half inch cores. I find that that's really easy for me to be able to plunge core after core after core and go for a long time without getting tired. I've gotten accustomed to understanding the soil moisture level in my lawn because when the moisture level is too wet, the manual core aerators don't work very well. And when it's too dry, they don't work very well as well. Today, I want to talk to you about that core aerator that I got back there. That's a manual one. Most people, when they go to aerate their lawn, either in the spring or the fall, they go off to a tool rental place close to their house. It's not usually worth buying a mechanical core aerator for your house because they cost so much. Most people rent mechanical ones or they buy those. So my preferred thing is to buy small hand tools. I like hand tools. I think uh, manual labor is pretty important uh, in life to understand how things work and for the physical, for the physicality of it. All that's to say, most people aerate their lawn in the spring and the fall. And it's fairly common knowledge that the best time to aerate a lawn is in the fall, simply because the grass blades are going to be sending most of the energy down into the root system for root growth as it as the grass plants prepare for winter. You're also going to find that if you have sandier soil, that the consistency of your soil is going to impact your ability to use a manual core aerator. Loose, sandy soils, in some cases, don't even really need to be aerated the same way that dense soils with a lot of clay in them do. The more modern ways of aerating a lawn have to do with using a mechanical core aerator or a liquid aeration product of some kind that gets sprayed onto the lawn. Hello guys, this is Brian Mounts. I run TurfMechanic.com and today I'm going to be talking to you about aeration. As I'm recording this video, it is winter. Today, however, I wanted to start thinking about aerating. I did not aerate my lawn in the fall but I did manually aerate a portion of my lawn this past spring, back in the spring, about nine months ago. Nine months ago, I used this tool and I went through the entire other side of my house over there with this tool. This was a very inexpensive tool that I bought on Amazon. Alternatively, you can rent power machines from probably local tool dealers, rental centers in your neighborhood. Uh, you could probably spend one to three hundred dollars on rentals or having companies come over to do a mechanical aeration of your lawn. I chose to spend, I don't know, somewhere between 30 and 50 bucks or so on a tool and just do it myself. It's good exercise. It does take a good long time, however. That's why products like this are so tempting. These are liquid aeration products. These are only two. These are just the two that I have here in my garage right now. There are many others out there. I've researched and looked at lots of them. These are the only two I have on hand. These are so tempting to use to aerate your lawn because they don't require the use of enormous amounts of manual labor using a core aeration tool. They don't require an enormous amount of time or money renting a large piece of machinery or purchasing it. I guess if you're made of money, you could go buy these things. They're thousands of dollars. But you can see the benefit of using these because most of us, especially my viewers here on the channel, most of us have liquid fertilizer spreaders, which these go into and you just spray it on your lawn. Probably takes about 10 minutes, depending on the size of your lawn. A mechanical core aerator is basically the same thing as a manual core aerator. The only difference is the cores are a little bit wider, they're a little bit bigger, and in some cases they go a little bit deeper. They're actually better cores and it's much easier 
to cover an entire lawn space with a mechanical core aerator. The problem is they are very expensive to buy, they are enormously heavy, and usually you need at least a couple people to get the job done. So although you could do a very large lawn in just an afternoon, it's a very hard and time consuming job. And if you hire it out, it can get kind of pricey. The liquid aeration products that are on the market only go part of the way. They do make it very easy to aerate a lawn. However, they don't truly aerate the lawn the way traditional spike and core aerators do. You're going to get a little bit of soil softening and you're going to be able to open up some areas within the soil for a more aerobic environment, which is going to be beneficial for the soil bacteria and the microbes that we want living in our lawn. The liquid aeration products are typically going to add a little bit of potassium to the lawn, which is helpful, and almost every single one of them is going to add humates to the lawn in the form of humic and fulvic acids. These things are going to spur biological life in your lawn and the biology that really gets going because of the application. It's going to help the soil particles kind of loosen up a little bit. Now the last main way of aerating your lawn is using a spike. Frequently you'll see people using a pitchfork and they'll take the pitchfork and they'll jam it into the ground. They're either like pound the ground or they're like plug it in with their feet. But the point being is they are poking holes in the lawn with the pitchfork. So which is better? A spike aerator or a plug aerator. Here I've got a very common plug or core aerator. This is the Yard Butler. It has two, it pulls two cores four inches deep and I've got a pitchfork. Most people use pitchforks um, or things very very similar to pitchforks uh, to spike aerate their lawn. Both of these things are going to poke holes into your lawn so obviously you're going to get holes. There's going to be aeration but the thing is, spike aerators of all forms, even the like weird shoe versions that they make, are nowhere near as good as core aerators. Core aerators are good simply because they actually remove material from the, from the lawn space. When you actually remove material from the lawn space, you are not only creating a channel for air, water, uh, and nutrients to get down into the subsoil, but you are also relieving compaction. So with a spike aerator, really all you're doing is you're making a hole, but you're making a hole by compacting the soil more. So although you will now have a channel for moisture uh, to get down into like below the soil surface, the soil that is there in the lawn is actually going to be a little bit harder simply because you've squished it together. Now there are a few circumstances where using a spike aerator is perfectly fine. If you literally just need to get moisture deep into the ground into let's say for instance compacted soil that is repelling water and you've got like water runoff, then a spike aerator can be a quick, uh, a quick easy win, especially since you probably already have a pitchfork sitting around. For core aerators, they're harder to use, uh, they do perform better. And if you're going to core aerate an entire yard space like this, you got to dedicate a pretty good amount of time to the project. Now the pitchfork or any kind of spike aerator, they're not pulling plugs. So they're not removing material from the lawn space. So they are not alleviating compaction the way that core aeration does. Liquid aeration does not alleviate compaction either, but it will add to the softening of the soil. What's up guys, this is Brian, turpmechanic.com. I want to talk to you about core aerating, what we need to do before we core aerate the lawn. But here's the deal. There's more things that we can do before we core aerate to amplify this effect even more. I say this because in 10 days exactly, I am core aerating my lawn for the second time this year. I core aerated at the end of March, just before spring really set in, and I'm going to do it again here just before fall sets in. 10 days out, this is the time to start busting out the liquid aeration products. Now this sounds, I don't know, counterintuitive. We're going to core aerate. Why would we need liquid? The liquid core aeration product is going to go into the soil and it's going to soften the soil enough to allow water to go deeper into the ground when we irrigate. And once we run the mechanical core aerator over the lawn, the cores are going to go in better. They're just going to go in better. You see, when you run a core aerator over a lawn that's compacted and hard and dry, you're going to be punching holes, but not all of those holes are going to be good holes. They're not going to be deep. You're going to be clogging the little like tubes that poke the holes, uh, the little core pluggers, whatever you want to call them. If we can soften that soil up and then water deep ahead of time, then it's going to make more pliable ground, softer ground. It's going to be easier for the cores to be pulled. Now there are some benefits to all of these methods, 
But the overarching thing that you need to keep in mind is that the best time to do any aeration is at the very end of winter going into spring and at the very end of summer going into fall. Both of these times are when our grass are wanting to put on new root development. So if we can open up channels, even if they are temporary channels, then those are areas where a grass can put new root growth into void spaces. Eventually those cores or channels close up on them and you end up with deeper, more substantial root systems. In the meantime, you're introducing additional airflow into the subsoil, which is gonna allow the bacteria and the microorganisms that rely on aerobic environments. They need oxygen to survive and to thrive. It's going to give them what they need so that they're gonna be able to break down organic matter in your lawn and release nutrients for your grass. All right, in today's video, we're going to talk about the differences between power raking a lawn and aerating a lawn. They're two very different things. There are reasons to do one or the other or both. First of all, it's important to keep in mind that both aerators and dethatchers or power rakes are designed by purpose to disrupt the upper layer of the soil profile. But the difference here is that a dethatcher or a power rake is going to score and rip and drag and scrape the upper quarter inch. We're talking a quarter inch of the soil profile underneath the leaf canopy of your lawn, while the aerator machine is going to be punching holes two to three inches deep into the soil profile but each hole is going to be separated by a few inches between the holes. So if you collectively add up the square footage disrupted by an aerator, it's approximately 6% of the lawn surface, whereas a dethatcher is going to disrupt uh, the vast majority of the lawn surface, but much less deep. Now I could go deep into the why. Why do we do this? Why is this important? But I'm going to save that for another video. I have a lot of other videos on aeration and why we do it. But I'm going to assume that you want to aerate your lawn. So when you aerate your lawn, if you're doing a core aeration, you want to shoot for a lot of cores. Don't go lazy. You want to go about 24 cores per square foot. If you're doing it manually, it's going to take a good amount of time. If you're going to be doing it mechanically, then you're going to have to do multiple passes with the big heavy machine. Fixing a rough lawn isn't that complicated. There's only a handful of major steps you need to take over the course of a year, and if you follow each step to completion, then the rest is just a waiting game. This video will briefly cover the first step, core aeration, which is typically done in the earliest parts of spring. To start off, this is important to understand. In my opinion, core aerating is something I consider to be optional for the casual lawn owner. But for those people looking to maintain the best yard possible, then it quickly becomes mandatory. Grassroot systems put on their greatest root mass each spring. Cool season grass types a little bit earlier in the spring, warm season grass types a little bit later in the spring. Pulling aeration cores makes it easier for deeper root penetration and water penetration during those rain events or irrigation sessions during the spring. Open cores also make the delivery of certain types of lawn products to the root zone more efficient, while also providing better oxygen flow to all of the beneficial microscopic organisms that live in our lawn. And if this biological life is not supported, then a lawn can only go so far. I personally endorse using liquid aeration products in addition to doing manual or mechanical core aeration. Spike aeration has its benefits, but I think that if you're gonna take the time to walk the lawn and poke a bunch of holes, you might as well be poking cores because it's gonna be better for your lawn in the long run. All right, this I've been, I bought these, bought them off of Amazon. These are uh, Spike Aerator shoe attachments. I bought these on a Black Friday sale in 2021. It's been, they've been sitting in my garage for like five months. Yeah. This is not what they're meant for. Are they safe? Are they safe? <laughs> well, they're spikes. They're like little like, this is not what they're meant for. But I'm gonna strap them on and use them for the first time and run over my dirt patches and just kind of scuff everything up. I'm missing laces. There's supposed to be laces there. All right, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Do they look good? Yeah. Ugh. 
Are they hard? Well, once they go way deep in the ground, I have to really think about pulling my foot up. It, so it's going to be really hard. Is it really hard to run? Uh, kind of hard to run. run. Yeah, it's like, it's like I'm wearing like boots that are like waterlogged, like tons of water in them. This is totally unnecessary. <laughs> Nobody should ever have to do this. Oh. Oh. Uh. 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 Oh. Totally unnecessary. It's kind of fun though. Another couple things to keep in mind when you aerate. It is helpful to have your grass a little bit short. It's helpful to remove as much surface debris off of your lawn as possible before you aerate. It is also extremely helpful to soften the soil with water or a surfactant or some sort of liquid aeration product in advance of core aerating. When your soil is extremely hard and compacted and then you go to core aerate, your cores are simply not going to be as deep and reliable. At the end of winter, it's actually fairly easy to have soft enough soil to pull good cores. But at the end of summer, you do have to take a few extra steps to ensure the cores that you do pull are going to benefit you as much as possible. Hey, what's up guys? This is Brian Mounts at RunTurpMechanic.com. I want to talk to you today about some of the more common things that are done to lawns right after aeration. Things that aren't easily done before aeration or any other time during the year. This is the perfect segue into the very first and the most obvious decision that you have to make. After you core aerate the lawn, you have to figure out whether you're going to leave those cores on the ground or pick them up. Now, if you don't want to do anything to your lawn other than to core aerate it, then it is probably best to just leave the cores on the ground. They will slowly assimilate back into the soil system and your lawn will still be aerated and the compaction will be lessened. There's nothing wrong with doing this. The shorter your grass is the more annoying it is because all of those cores are sitting on top of the grass and they're very noticeable the longer your grass is the less noticeable it is but that choice is up to you whether or not you're going to do any of these other things that are options in my opinion after core aerating the lawn this is the best time in the world to introduce material into your lawn into the soil system of your lawn that is very difficult to do at other times of the year this is the second time this year that i core aerated my lawn the first time was in the spring the very beginning of spring and i top dressed my lawn after aeration with peat moss for its immediate acidifying effect in the uppermost level of my soil and i top dressed with worm castings worm castings are just amazing it's really hard to quantify their goodness in a couple short sentences they do so much for the lawn they do so much for soil systems that it's hard to argue putting anything down other than worm castings now, when I applied those things to my lawn back in late March and early April, I push broomed them all in as getting as many of them into the cores, the open cores of my lawn system as possible. This time around, I'm going to be doing something similar, but I'm going to be top dressing with something different. Let me show you. All right, over here, I have biochar. I literally have five different biochars. I am putting an article together over on my website where I'm comparing as many of the biochars that could be used in our lawns as possible and kind of giving you information about them along with links to supporting documents from like really like, you know, PhD level uh, research studies that have been put out on biochar. But if you go ahead and just, I don't know, head over to Google and just search for turf mechanic biochar, you're gonna find the page online and it kind of be a living document where uh, I'm always updating it and kind of uh, expanding the information on it. Because as lawn care enthusiasts, I don't want to just buy any old product. If I'm going to be buying a product and spending the time and energy to apply it to the lawn, I want to make sure that it's probably the best one. To be brief, the benefits of applying biochar are this. If you can put biochar down into the soil system, it's going to help your lawn retain water and water soluble nutrients because those things get sucked up into the uh, porosity of the biochar substance, substrate, substance, I don't know. It's gonna get sucked up into the biochar, which is down in the soil system, and it will hold that water and the nutrients there. Now there are different kinds of biochars. They're made from different source materials. All of them are gonna work slightly different depending on the temperature of paralysis, depending on the, uh, the source material used to create the biochar, depending on the slowness or the fastness of the py pyrolysis. There's a lot of science behind it, but what we get down to as lawn owners is 
can I put it on the lawn? Really, that's, in my opinion, one of the most important questions to answer. Now, biochar is not the only other thing. Top dressing your lawn with all of this stuff isn't the only thing. One of the more common things that people do after they core aerate the lawn is they overseed. You can go ahead and apply grass seed to the lawn at an overseeding rate with the cores left on the ground or without. Now if you remove the cores from the ground then that makes it a little bit easier to do a lawn leveling job. So if you want to do a lawn leveling job which is another really common thing to do after core aeration with those holes opened up it's a lot easier to just spread sand over the lawn you'll get some of the sand going down into the holes created in the ground so they're going to fill up just like if you were top dressing in it but they're still going to stay loose so you're still going to be able to get root development into those cores easier than any other time during the year. When you level, it's best to level after the grass has been cut particularly short, a lot shorter than you normally do, and that's exactly what we have just done when we core aerated the lawn. Possibly you core aerated the lawn and didn't lower the cut of your grass, but I did, and I recommend just about everyone who's going to be aerating to do that. Because cutting your grass shorter than normal is a little bit of a stressor on the grass, I would prefer to do both of these things at the same time. Also, just before I aerate anyway, I put down a nitrogen-based fertilizer. Really, it's an all-purpose fertilizer, kind of a NPK mix. So we're getting fertilizer into the lawn so it wants to grow. And when you go to do a leveling job, you also want to be heavily fertilizing to push growth so those grass blades can grow up and poke through the material that you're using to level the lawn, whether it be just plain sand or a sandy soil mix or some other product that is special to you. Now, I wouldn't recommend dethatching after core aeration because dethatching the little prongs or a scarifier blades, whatever you're going to be using, are going to be cutting ground that has already been damaged by the core aerator. So you're going to really start ripping things up quite easily. That's why it's best practice to do dethatching before the core aeration. So I here in my yard, I did do a light dethatching before the core aeration, so I'm not going to be running that now. We want the grass to recover a little bit, root systems to thicken up a little bit, especially if we put grass seed down, we're probably not even going to want to dethatch for the next couple months or so, because all of those roots are still going to be delicate, short, and uh, fragile. Now, I do recommend keeping your grass short for a little bit. Let's call it a week to 10 days or so after you core aerate because as we put down the top dressing and as we, in my case, I'm going to be push brooming the lawn, uh, it's going to be a lot easier to deal with the push broom and the spreading and the pushing stuff down into the cores when the grass is short. And already, we've already stressed this grass out by cutting it this short. So let's just keep it short and let it kind of recover at this level because later in the season, we can then grow it back out and it's actually going to be standing on stronger uh stronger feet by scalping it down going into the aeration and kind of leaving it here we're kind of training the grass to be a little bit shorter as we go into the fall which isn't necessarily necessary but as we train it to be a little bit shorter in the fall we have a little bit more flexibility in letting the grass grow up and come back down and then at the end of fall we have a little bit more flexibility in how long we want to keep the grass before we go into winter dormancy to piggyback on that benefit you as much as possible core aerating is hard no matter how you do it it's simply a hard job and most people want to do it but never get around to doing it. If you finally do take the step to do a core aeration on your lawn, don't waste the opportunity. There are really special things that you can do to your lawn immediately following core aeration that are very hard to incorporate into a lawn in any other scenario at any other time during the year. Now, as we push forward closer to core aeration date, we get closer to four to three to two days out then we're going to go ahead and water deep one more time but we're going to cut the grass shorter than normal at this point if we cut the grass shorter than normal then it's going to be easier again for the core plugger puller thing the machine to actually pull holes out of your soil surface also it'll be easier to clean up the mess 
after the cores have been pulled when the grass is a little bit shorter. Now you don't have to clean up those cores off the ground, but I do because I go ahead and I take those cores and I use them in other parts of my yard. And the other reason why I don't want them on the ground is because I'm a huge advocate for top dressing the lawn after core aeration. Now that's a different video down the road. Once our grass is short and we've had deep watering sessions ahead of time and we've applied a liquid aeration product onto the ground to soften the soil up a little bit, the next main thing that we really need to do is actually apply a fertilizer to the ground. We need to apply a balanced fertilizer at this point because remember, we're going into a high growth phase for our grass and the root systems of our grass. We want to put something balanced that has N, P, and K, but we don't want anything like crazy. We don't want to just push like excessive growth, nor do I particularly want to push extremely fast growth. So what I'm going to be putting down is uh, a lawn box product called Fall Fix. Uh, it's a 555 product, so it's a... Uh, Grand scheme of things, when after I apply it, I will have put down a quarter pound of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium on the lawn all at once. Uh, as you know, this is not very much, but it is a balanced amount, and it's going to help that lawn push new healthy growth into the cores that are pulled. Now, another optional step to take prior to the core aeration is the application of root growth stimulant products. So for me, I use Cytogrow. Cytogrow is a uh, it's kind of concentrated form of cytokinins, which is the hormone that's found in sea kelp and sea kelp extracts and things like that. So as you are looking for products to put down on the lawn, anything that contains sea kelp or seaweed extracts are going to have cytokinins in it. I choose Cytogrow simply because I'm getting more of them. Uh, it's a dedicated product. Uh, for that purpose. You could use Next RGS, which is a common one used here in uh, lawn DIY lawn settings, but there are other products out there. The cytokinins in Cytogrow and other products like that are going to uh, stimulate root development right at the time that roots want to grow anyway. So if we stimulate them to grow and we then we core aerate, right as Mother Nature is telling those roots to grow, they're really going to expand and they're gonna help our lawns be very, very healthy throughout the remainder of the year. Now, for the most part, all of these steps really are unnecessary. They're optional, except for maybe watering the grass and cutting the lawn. We need to do those things anyway. But the thing is, if you're gonna be core aerating the lawn, that's the hard part. Most people don't actually core aerate the lawn. So if you're gonna core aerate the lawn, you've already committed to doing the hardest step of them all. You might as well take action on the smaller steps as well to kind of supercharge your results. The entire purpose of aerating your lawn is to provide pathways in the form of little, you know, quarter to half inch tubes uh, that go into the dirt, into your lawn soil. Those pathways allow air to go in, air to flow out, and it allows for water to go in, it allows for nutrients. So if you're fertilizing the lawn, uh, you can apply fertilizer and it will go into the holes or the cores and make it down to the root zone much more efficiently than if you just top dress or just apply to the foliar leaves or to the ground surface. Somewhere along the way, you've heard that aerating your lawn and dethatching your lawn are worth your time and effort and money. But do you really know exactly how fast it improves your lawn or how dramatically it improves your lawn? That's what I want to show you today because not that long ago, hey there baby girl. So not that long ago, it's about three weeks or so, I applied a, a liquid aeration product. A few days later, I applied a quarter pound of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus through a granular product. Then I applied a little bit of cytokinins, which are root growth stimulants. Core aerated and dethatch. I dethatched a couple days before I core aerated. The whole thing took, what is it, like three weeks, give or take a day. And today I'm going to show you exactly the results. And now I got to put these on because baby girl wants me to. All right, so this is where my lawn stands today, the 13th of September. And you see in the overlay here, this is what it looked like on August 27th. August 27th actually was six days after I applied a liquid aeration product to the lawn, the Air 8. And as you can see in all of these overlays, they're all from the same date, August 27th. This is the day that I put down Cytogrow, which is a biostimulant for root growth. I put down a uh, liquid thatch removal product. And then I put it down a spoon-fed 555 product uh, to lightly fertilize the lawn coming out of summer. You can see 
that everything looks so much greener, much less brown. Uh, both of these lawn scenarios are fresh cut. They're both cut on the lowest setting possible on the same exact rotary mower. After I did this, I ran my electric dethatcher over the entire lawn, raked everything up, and then I core aerated. Of course, after I core aerated, I also applied a little bit of a biochar, but that does not stimulate any growth or nutrition for the plant. It's just kind of just a soil amendment. The point here is getting airflow into the lawn and dethatching the lawn pretty much at the same time, especially at the end of the summer when our lawns really want to put on new root growth and top growth is incredibly obvious. Like the result, look at this screen right there. The results are insane. All right, it's been 14 days now since the actual core aeration. And if you're curious, can you see any aeration holes? It is very hard to see any core aeration holes at this time. The vast majority of the holes have pretty much been covered up by new grass, kind of closed in on themselves, and generally been just reassimilated into the lawn. I did pick up the cores. So you can surmise that the actual lawn is nowhere near as compacted as it was not that long ago. The thing is that most of these products are not going to provide pathways for air to go down and back up, but they are going to allow water. My chickens just went crazy back there. They are going to allow water to go deeper into the ground a little bit easier. And that's because the vast majority of liquid aeration products use really direct surfactants in them, which are wetting agents, or they kind of create that wetting agent effect. But I do believe that they imply a little bit more than they actually do. These do work really well as surfactants and they do add uh, carbon components into the lawn and they do stimulate microbial life and activity. Now the surfactant portion of these products is what allows water to hit the ground and get absorbed in it. Now everyone knows of a time in your life, maybe it's every single time you water the lawn, but when you hit water on the lawn, if it just pools there on the surface and kind of like trickles down the hill, that is a surface tension problem. So the water hits the lawn, if it gets absorbed straight in like a sponge, then that is, that's fantastic. That's what we want. But in many situations, that water hits the surface of our soil and it doesn't absorb very quickly or easily. You see this a lot in gardening. Now here, I've recently aerated the lawn. You can see little holes all over the place. If you do look very close in between all of the grass blades, you're gonna find that there is grass and then there is surface debris which is generally leaves and grass clippings and then under the surface debris is a thatch layer which is typically made of roots and rhizomes that are growing barely above the soil level but underneath the leaf canopy. Essentially you're looking at grass followed by dead grass clippings followed by thatch followed by soil. Now there's nothing at all wrong with having thatch in the lawn. In fact, it's a healthy thing. This is where a lot of biology really starts its life. A lot of the microorganisms and fungi start in the thatch layer. We just don't want too much thatch. If we have too much thatch in the lawn, then that prevents water from penetrating through the thatch into the soil itself. It also prevents fertilizers and nutrients from getting down into the soil where the grass actually needs it. We don't want the grass root systems growing in the thatch layer. We want the grass root systems growing in the soil underneath the thatch. So long story short is we want the thatch layer to be there, but we want the lower part of the thatch layer to constantly be decomposing and becoming part of the soil. If you know anything at all about composting, then you know that you need oxygen and moisture to get things to decompose. And the thatch layer needs to be moist and oxygenated to be able to decompose. So both a power rake and a core aeration device can come into play and help this process along. A power rake is literally going to score. It's going to rip little tiny, thin, skinny like cuts into the thatch layer to break it apart a bit. 
It's going to introduce a little bit of oxygen into those upper layers, while a core aeration device is going to open up entire channels and remove small sections of thatch altogether. Regardless of how you look at it, both core aeration and power rakes are going to introduce extra oxygen into the thatch layer to help it decompose more efficiently. Now, if you do run a lawnmower over your lawn regularly throughout the year, but don't bag the clippings and you instead you mulch those clippings right back onto the lawn, then a lot of those clippings are going to sit on top of the thatch layer. And if you don't mow very often, then those clippings are usually going to be quite big. If you mow frequently, then they're teeny tiny and they break down very efficiently. But big clippings are a problem because they dry out and then they start accumulating. One of the biggest benefits of power raking is that it actually removes a lot of the largest debris that is not breaking down in the lawn the way it's supposed to. And at the end of winter, it's a fantastic way of pulling all of the dead debris off of the soil surface so that your soil can warm up and start performing in an aerobic environment as opposed to an anaerobic environment in the absence of oxygen. Now here in my lawn and all of the lawns that I've managed in the past, I always recommend core aerating two times every single year. I recommend at the very end of winter or the very beginning part of spring so that we can capitalize on the grass's natural tendencies to want to put on new root growth. If we're pulling physical cores out of the ground right in the root zone, then compaction is going to be minimal and it's going to be extremely easy for the roots to spread into new spaces and potentially deeper into the ground. The additional airflow of aeration is going to spur additional microbial activity in the lawn. This is activity that is needed for our grass to uptake nutrients properly. Many nutrients can't even become plant available until microbial life makes them plant available. And microbial life will always be stunted if there is an absence of air. What's up guys, this is Brian Mouse with TurpMechanic.com. Today, I core aerated my lawn. And I wanna tell you everything that you need to know about core aerating your lawn mechanically with one of those big gas powered machines. Now, before we get too far into the video, I want you to know that manually core aerating your lawn is an option if you have a very small space. I would say that if you have a space that's 500 square feet or less, I would just grab a manual core aerator, do it yourself. It doesn't take that long if you're gonna be doing it manually, but anything above 500 square feet, it's gonna be really hard to go through a lot of area. I would estimate for 2,500 square feet, which is the size of my flat yard here, that it would take me approximately 15 hours to properly manually do it. That equates to about three hours for every 500 square feet. If it's gonna take you more than three hours, it might be worth it just going out to a tool rental place and renting a mechanical core aerator. That's what I had done for my yard. Now, I have small kids. They're run around all the time, not exactly when I'm recording a video, but if I'm gonna be running a big mechanical core aerator, or you are, you need to know that these things are heavy beasts. It's very difficult to actually move them around all by yourself. So for me, I ended up hiring a company, a local guy here in my town that I've used for a number of projects before, and I recommend a lot of you guys hire someone locally to do this as well. It doesn't cost too much more money than doing it yourself, and you don't have to physically do the labor. The reason I say that is this is really a two-person job. For one, even if you go rent the thing, you need a big truck or trailer to be able to put this machine in. It's bigger than a regular lawnmower. Most lawnmowers are smaller than these, and most lawnmowers are lighter than these. Being able to pick them up into a truck or a trailer and down, manhandle it around the yard, making turns, it's really helpful to have a second pair of hands available to help you pick these things up and move them around, pick them onto trailers and off and whatnot. I had my lawn mechanically core aerated back in March, and there was two people that came to do it, and they work together as a team. I just had my lawn mechanically or aerated earlier today, and it also took two people to do it. If you're gonna be doing this yourself and not hiring it out, make sure that you have a second pair of hands available to help you load these things onto and off of trucks and maneuver around corners, because when you use these machines in the middle of a yard, 
in big, wide open stretches, it's fine. The problem is when you go along fence lines that bend a little bit, or as you see, I've got a tree back behind me with a planter bed. I've got another tree over there. I've got lots of tight spaces that are very hard to move these things around. The standard way of core aerating your lawn with one of these mechanical machines is to just go in long passes. Now you're gonna to wanna to do a double pass because proper core aeration requires approximately 24 holes per square foot. If you're only doing a single pass, you're not coming close to doing that. A double pass, you're still not usually getting up to that 24 cores per square foot, but it's an awful lot better than a single pass. Now in an ideal world, you're gonna be crisscrossing your paths. You're gonna be going this way, and then you're gonna be going this way. That way you're not gonna have quite the same like pattern of lines. They're gonna be a little bit more scattered and spread about. When you go to turn on one of these things, it's a lot like turning on a gas-powered lawnmower, a big gas-powered lawnmower, potentially a ride-on lawnmower. You've got a choke, you've got a throttle, you've also got a pull cord on most aerator machines that you're going to be using. They're on the bar, you've got a lever that goes up and down. When you press the lever down, it allows the tines to dig down into the ground and lift the rolling wheels off of the ground. When you get to the end of a row, when you wanna turn the machine, you have to pull that bar back up so that the tines pull out of the ground. As they pull out of the ground, the whole machine drops down and sits on the wheels that you can then roll across the ground. These machines are able to just roll freely across the ground without the tines hitting the ground, but you have to be able to pick those tines up. Now the tines, once they're in the ground and you squeeze the engage bar, so whichever machine you've got, it's gonna have its own bar or handle. For the machine that was used here in my yard, it's got two little like motorcycle style handles. You squeeze those together and then the tines start moving. It's kind of like a self-propelled lawnmower. Thing is, it doesn't start slowly and ramp up. Once you push that thing, it just goes because the tines are directly in the ground. Because they're in the ground, it's instantly gonna take off on you. You don't wanna fight it. You have to be ready for it to move instantly right when you squeeze the trigger. Now, when you get to ends of rows, you have to, you have to let go of the self-propelled or the, the tine engage mechanism, and it will come to a stop. But those tines are still in the ground. So if you're gonna be turning the machine, you can't just turn it because the tines are literally in the ground. You have to lift the tines off the ground before you turn. Now, most of these machines are gonna have a very thick, wide wheel on the front that rolls, and then they're gonna have two smaller wheels on the back, flanking the left and the right, exactly where the tines would be. Now, as you can imagine, you can tilt that thing back onto the back wheels and pivot the machine around, or you can lift the back of the machine up onto the front wheel and pivot off of the front wheel to make it turn. In some cases, depending on the topography of your land and what obstacles are close to you, you might need a second person literally to just turn the machine. Not to mention the fact that if your lawn is a little bit of a hill or if you're on a small grade, it becomes even more difficult. Now, over here, I've got a hill back behind me, which I have not irrigated this year because we're in a drought. We did take the core aerator up a little bit up the hill. Now, the core aerator would continue going up the hill quite easily if we wanted it to, but it's harder to keep the thing under control because you're on a hill and the machine is so heavy. So if the machine wants to tilt and kind of turn sideways, it is very easy to lose control of the machine on a hill. So be very careful if you have a grade. Even this area that I'm sitting on right now is on a grade. This is the high side and this is the low side. So as you're running parallel to the grade, the weight of the machine comes down and then it leans this way. It still wants to go that way. So as you're going, the tines that are digging into the ground over here are digging in deeper than the ones over here because the weight of the machine is pushing that direction. The steeper the grade is, the more careful you have to be. Now, another thing to say is that you cannot run these machines right up against the edge of things. You just can't do it. The wheel is here and then the tines are on the inside. So as you're planning for your core aeration process, you have to understand that you're not gonna be able to core aerate 
all the way up to a fence line or all the way up to a sidewalk. You're not gonna be able to core aerate over paver stones or anywhere close to sprinkler heads that are in the ground. You're gonna end up having strips and patches throughout your lawn that cannot be core aerated with the mechanical machine. You're gonna to have to go over those areas with a manual core aerator or just use liquid aeration products on those areas only. Guys, I've been manually core aerating my lawn this morning. This is the first time of the 2022 season that I'm actually doing this. I've done this in the previous years, 2021 and 2020. I've done a lot of square footage using this Yard Butler two prong, two core puller manual tool here. I've used it enough to feel confident giving you some helpful tips on how to get this job done better and correctly. I don't know, I'm not gonna make it done faster, that's for sure. But anyway, let's get into it. These are just tips. By far and away, if you're gonna manually core air at your lawn, the most important thing for you to understand is you don't wanna do this unless you've got an enormous amount of time. To properly core air at a lawn, you're looking at at least 20 cores per square foot. I shoot for about 24, it's just, I don't know, it just makes sense to me. And there are university studies out there that have shown that anywhere between 20 and 40 is optimum. I can't imagine trying to do 40 cores per square foot. So I shoot for 24. To do that correctly, it takes a lot of time. We're talking for every 100 square feet of space, it takes me 45 minutes. And I usually have to take a break at least once or twice in there to catch my breath. I use a two prong unit. There are three prongs and four prongs. There might be ones that have even more or where the cores or tines, whatever you want to call it. I don't recommend doing the three, four, fives or whatever that they have because it takes a lot of energy and weight, honestly, weight and energy and muscle to push the cores into the ground. But not only that, you have to pull it back up. So if you've got three, four, five, it just takes more energy to push it down and pull it up. So yeah, you're pulling more cores at once, but man, you're gonna be going slow. You're gonna tire out much faster. I recommend using the two prongs because you can just go. Usually you can go for a pretty long time. Even if you get tired, you can keep on going. Now, if you're shooting for that 24 cores per square foot, you're gonna be poking holes in the ground that are approximately two inches apart. To do that evenly, I recommend sticking with geometric shapes. For me, that means rectangles and squares. I pick small little rectangles and squares and I just do lines back and forth, or I'll do lines this way and then that way and then this way. That way I know that each line is getting the exact same amount of cores and I can see exactly the pattern. So once you scrape all of these cores off the ground, which you don't have to do, but most people probably do it, especially shortcut lawns. Once you scrape them off the ground, if you look down at it, you kind of see this grid pattern in the holes. Now, if you just randomly go and poke holes all over the place, you are most likely not going to get the, the amount of cores that you need in the lawn. And you're probably gonna get a lot of cores in one spot and few cores in another. And you're not even gonna really notice it until everything's cleaned up. Now, to continue on with getting the job done, you gotta get the timing right. Now, I have tried doing this at multiple times throughout the year. It is always best done manually in the early spring or the end of winter, in my opinion. And I believe that that is because soil moisture is almost always present. Even when it's dry, it's still a little bit damp. And especially up north, you go through freeze and thaw cycles. So as the soil moisture uh, frosts and freezes, and then it thaws, it kind of expands, contracts, it kind of keeps the soil soft, even when it's dry. Now, having said that, it can't be dry because you still have to drive that thing through the soil to pull the plug. So I do recommend watering the lawn, even in the middle of the winter or the late winter, like right now it's February where I live. This is a warm day in February, but it, it froze last night. So a couple days ago, I brought my hose out during the middle of the afternoon and I watered the lawn. I wait a couple days and then I do this. You can't do this easily on dry soil. I would probably have to pack on another couple hundred pounds to be able to do that. But if I dampen the soil up and go through a couple freeze thaw, thaw cycles, then it's really easy to get the core aerator into the ground and back up. The thing never clogged. Basically, I did this whole section. This thing never clogged once. Now, if you have heavy clay soil, it is more likely to clog, especially if that clay soil is 
uh, extremely damp. So make sure that you're not over watering a couple days in advance. If you do water a little bit too much and your, uh, your core aerator is clogging, you probably just want to clear the clog and then wait a couple days for that clay to kind of dry out a little bit. Clay will pack itself together. It's like Play-Doh. You ever pulled Play-Doh out of a little like uh, Play-Doh container when it's brand new? It just doesn't want to come out. Now the flip side of that coin is if you have particularly sandy soil, sand doesn't really want to bond together very well. So the whole point of a core is it's all bound together and it comes up through the core and you get this little dirt worm there. Sandy soil in some cases doesn't even need to be aerated quite as much as some of the other soil types simply because the the particles aren't bound together the same way. However it still will benefit from core aeration. I find that with really sandy soil if you're going to be core aerating this is very situational but if you can core aerate at like dawn on a morning that's like 31 degrees it's going to work better because those particles especially if they're moist are going to be able to bond together a little bit better simply because of the crisp cool frosty weather during the summer if you're going to be doing this towards the end of the summer going into the fall it's a lot harder to get thorough moisture into the, into the lawn and plus coming out of summer the ground is usually really hard even when you wet it so you're going to have to water heavier at the end of the summer and core aerate closer to the watering time i don't really recommend manually core aerating going into the fall because most soils that i've attempted to do this on are almost it almost never works out like the core aerator just can't i mean it's pushing holes in but it's not actually pulling cores out so you're kind of compacting soil deep and leaving a hole on the surface it's kind of like spike aerating if you can get that moisture content correct then it can work but it's much easier to do this at the end of winter going into spring typically speaking you're going to be shooting for three three and a half inch cores but you're almost never going to get it if you were to if you were to look at some of these cores, this is one of the longest ones. This one's probably about three inches or so. Most of these are probably about two inch cores. It's just simply hard to pull a full core. So manually core aerating is, you're gonna, it's a lot of work. Uh, doesn't cost very much uh, outside of your own time and energy. Uh, but your cores are going to be better when you use a, a, a mechanical core aerator. It's something that has a, a wider tine and can sometimes pull a deeper core as well. As an added benefit of aeration, we are physically removing roughly 6% of the thatch layer every time we core aerate. This is particularly beneficial for lawns that have stoloniferous or rhizomatic growth habits. That would be virtually all warm season grasses, Kentucky bluegrass, bent grass, creeping red fescue. And if you have issues with keeping the lawn wet, and irrigated then running a power rake over it to continually increase airflow into the mat of thatch will benefit you in the long run now here in my new lawn i actually just ran the power rake over this lawn a few times over the past month or so getting as many of the old stems and stolons up off the ground so that i could cut them one major benefit of running a power rake over your lawn is that you can actually pick up stems and stolons off of the dirt that you can cut with your lawnmower at a later time. If you never cut those stems, then they are always going to be brown and your lawn is always going to have a hue of brown to it every time you cut it. I have pruned many of my stems and stolons way back over the past month or two and I have recently core aerated to introduce that oxygen flow. I recommend doing both. And in the long run, if you do do both activities, your lawn will benefit in ways that are hard to express in words. Now to core aerate properly, you wanna get at least 20 cores per square foot. So if you're using a big machine like the one that you see back there, then you kinda of gotta look at it with a measuring stick and do a little bit of math, it's super easy. Now getting up close to this guy, this is 14 inches across, like the working width. And then if you put a plug straight down and then push the machine forward and measure how long it takes for that plug to circle all the way back around and get to the ground, then that'll show you the 
full cylinder uh, path, uh, the distance. For this particular machine, it's 36 inches. So that means every time that cylinder with all of the, uh, the core tines on it circles around, I'm covering a 36 inch, inch path, 14 inches wide. And this particular machine has 24 coring tines on the cylinder, which means I'm getting 24 cores for every 36 by 14 inch strip. Converting that to square feet, I actually need to do roughly four passes across the same area to get more than 20 cores per square foot. Now, instead of going one, two, three, four, I'm going to go one, two, one, two, one, two, and then start going this way, one, two, one, two, one, two. By doing that, I'm going to have plenty of stagger, not that I could keep this thing exactly in line to begin with, uh, but I'll have plenty of stagger and I'm, in, and I'm going to end up getting a lot of cores per square foot. It's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 25 cores per square foot. If you do end up having clogs, whether it be like little rocks or just uh, just chunks of soil that just clog up the thing, I also recommend having a drill handy with an old bit that you don't care about. Uh, I find that those are really easy to clear the clogs out if I just take the drill and just drill right into, you know, when you pull this out, you just drill right into the tine. Um, and all everything comes out. If rocks get jammed in there, the drill bit isn't really going to work. So in that case, kind of just kind of tapping a, a long nail or a screwdriver in there can help. But keep these things handy because when you're using a manual core aerator, things will clog even under the best of scenarios. What you see here, nothing clogged in the amount of time that I did this. I didn't have to clear the clog once, but at some point going through this lawn, it will clog. I can guarantee you that and I'll have to be prepared to unclog it. Now I've talked about doing this at the end of winter going into the spring as an optimal time for the physical nature of pulling these cores. Like it's just easier to do it at this time of year, but it's also better for the grass as well because during the springtime, that's a natural root growth, uh, root growth period for our grass. So as we're poking coals right now at the end of winter, just before all the grass starts growing, all of the roots start growing as well. So if they have space, those roots are going to go into those holes and down, and it's going to be a better rooting process, a more substantial rooting process. And you'll end up having deeper roots that are going to be helping your grass as uh, spring pushes into summer and drought and heat conditions really start stressing the lawn out. All right, every aerator machine is gonna be different. This is the first time I've ever used that particular model. I've used others in the past. This one does not like any kind of side to side slope, even if it is uh, very, very small. So over here, it's mostly flat, but it's just too slopey to use that. So over here, I'm gonna have to manually uh, aerate, uh, especially over here, because the ground kind of wants to go like that a little bit, and I just can't get it over there. I avoided my uh, fill hole here and the middle of the, my fill hole there in the middle. But everywhere along the edges, I'll have to manually core aerate with uh, one of those like plunger tools. But you can see doing many passes over everything, I've got a lot of holes and a lot of mess. Not to mention messes on the sidewalk. Notice everything is wet. It's easier to core aerate if your lawn is damp. Hi guys. Since things are wet, I personally am going to rake them off and take them to the backyard because I got some low spots back there that I want to use the cores uh, to bring uh, the ground up to grade. And uh, then I'll give you the after shot here. It's actually going to look way better than you think it's going to look once it's all done. Cool machine, but seriously, I wanted to go this way across the whole thing but it's just too much of a slope for it. So as I was going this way, it just wanted to lean ever so slightly and then the motor would die. Keep that in mind. If you rent yourself an aerator and you can't keep the thing started, it might be because uh, you've got too much of a slope on a side to side. You gotta go up and down the slope. There are two main ways of core aerating your lawn. You can use a manual tool to pull cores, which can take a lot of time and energy to do right, or you can use a mechanical aerator, which are usually far faster to use, but they do cost more to either rent or to buy. 
most people choose the mechanical route and they either rent a machine from a local shop to do it themselves or they hire the job out to a local lawn care service provider. Personally, I've done the job both manually and using a rented machine. I've also hired the job out before too, which was significantly more relaxing. The most important thing to keep in mind, however, is this really should be the first thing you do in the spring other than mow the lawn. Aeration holes need to be in place prior to pre-emergent application and during the start of the strongest rooting period of the year to yield the greatest benefits. If you do choose to top dress your lawn, then the aeration holes can benefit that process as well. Now, for those of you with lawns that are in really bad shape, aerating will still be useful. And for those of you with lawns that are already in good shape, aeration this time of year is one of those techniques that you can use to improve your lawn in subtle ways through the improved nutrient uptake and improved drought and heat tolerance that you'll experience later in the year. Usually, you'll want to time core aeration just ahead of a good rain so that the core walls don't dry out so fast or you'll want to plan on running an irrigation session within a few days following core aeration. In only a few weeks time, the walls of your aeration channels will start closing in on themselves and will become lightly filled in with soil, organic matter, both living and dead, and the surface area of those channels will not dry out the same way as they did when they were fresh. What's up guys, this is Brian Mounts. I run TurfMechanic.com in this channel, and today I'm coming to you with a video that's just interesting. This is not a tutorial. You can take whatever information out of it that you want and apply it however you want. I just find this stuff fun. What I wanna show you today is, uh, I guess the power, the strength, uh, the importance of putting organic top dressing down on a lawn right after you core aerate. Now I know a lot of people, they core aerate and then they overseed. What I like to do, what I think is really beneficial before you, you overseed, if you're gonna overseed, is to put down organic matter as a top dressing over your lawn after a core aeration. The reason for that is that is the best opportunity you're ever going to have to literally inject organic material into your lawn. You know, we top dress on top of a lawn and it just sits on top. It sits on top and kind of incorporates uh, top down. It goes underneath the leaf canopy of the, the turf grass. Um, if you don't apply it too thick, and then it just sits on top of the soil. We hope that it gets incorporated, but by core aerating, we can ensure that it gets down in there. All right. So as you see here, here's my tree that I planted a couple weeks ago. Today is March 12th. March 12th. So most of our grass is still dormant and I am slowly in the process of core aerating manually my entire lawn. So everything that you see right here to here and to there has been core aerated. In fact, here are the piles of the cores that I have yet to scoop up off the ground. And here are all the little holes that you see. There's a whole bunch of them. Doing simple math, if you're pulling a half inch core, on average about two inches in depth, then that is about 0.39 cubic inches of material. Now I'm striving for 24 cores per square foot, and I've done approximately 350 square foot. So if you do all of the math there, you end up getting to, the, to about 1.9 to two cubic feet of material that I have uh, pulled up out of the lawn right in this section, right there, right to the start of the garden bed over there. Now over here, I'm not gonna do anything because I wanna have a side-by-side -side where we can see the difference. All right, I got it all cleaned up and here are my mysterious products. So let's talk about what I'm gonna be putting down on the lawn. Now, I got worm castings here. I've talked about this in a past video, uh, the video where I woke up that green patch over there back in February. Uh, worm castings, this is a one cubic foot bag. I went to a local garden store here in my town to buy this. I spent $15 for one cubic feet. 
This is an expensive product and this is one of the cheaper bags of worm castings that I've ever come across. Worm castings tend to, um, they tend to be rich in micronutrients, like tons of micronutrients. Uh, lots of things that we don't even think of to put on the lawn. Um, I have seen references to worm castings have, having something along the lines of like 60 to 70 different kinds of micronutrients in them. Uh, as for their NPK rating, uh, average NPK ratings for worm castings is somewhere in the vicinity of 100, uh, possibly slightly higher than that in the nitrogen category, uh, depending on the brand. This bag doesn't even label it uh, as an NPK, I don't believe. Point being is this stuff, uh, let's see, like a pound of this can hold something like nine pounds of water. So it's enormous amount of moisture retention, uh, tons of uh, uh, nutrients getting injected into the soil. Uh, here I got some peat moss. Most of us know what peat moss is. Uh, peat moss doesn't really have any nutritional value, but it does condition the soil. It allows for um, uh, water retention and just kind of a general loosening of the soil when it's incorporated uh, into the growing medium. There are some trace minerals and, and whatnot in it, especially in the higher quality peat mosses. Uh, this, for the most part for me, I'm using this as a filler to lower the cost of application. Uh, peat moss is frequently used to do that as well. Uh, it's blended into things to keep costs down um, because it's 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 beneficial um, and it doesn't cost very much. Now it will also break down. This is compostable, so it's a carbon-based uh, component to a compost pile. So in the lawn, once you get it underneath the soil surface and all of the worms and the bugs and the microbes are going through it, it will slowly break down and compost. Um, it starts off a little bit pH uh, acidic, pH low, and over time as it composts and incorporates into the soil, it will uh, normalize kind of in that 7.0 range, maybe like 6869, just somewhere in that range. In addition to that, I'm going to be putting down this product called Green Sand. This is from the Down to Earth company. I've used their, their humic acids before, and we've got some other, other products in the garage that we use in our garden. Green sand, as you notice, does not have an NPK rating on this box. However, some green sand boxes from other companies, bags from other companies, will label this as high as a 003. Green sand, if you're unfamiliar with it, and I would be surprised if you were familiar with it, green sand is uh, kind of the sedimentary, sedimentary product that's harvested from marine layers, like under, under the sea. But point being is for hundreds of years, this has been used as a, as a soil amendment. Uh, similar to how peat moss and worm castings work, it will retain uh, moisture really well. It, it contains an enormous amount of uh, micronutrients and just miscellaneous uh, trace minerals and things that help um, in very, very mysterious ways. Uh, this is, from what I understand, a very high quality product. And a lot of, you know, that right there, it's a five pound, uh, five pounds for a lawn setting. This is not normally spread on lawns, uh, but references that I've found uh, through studies out there say that uh, roughly 15 pounds goes down on every thousand square feet of lawn space. So since I'm dealing with 350 square feet, I'm going to be putting five pounds down on the whole thing. Now, this is going to have some slow release potassium in there. Uh, it's a natural, uh, a natural organic source of potassium in the world. So I'm excited to kind of see what it does. So anyway, I'm going to mix all three of these products together, just kind of on the lawn, since none of them are true fertilizers. Um, it's not going to be precise. I'm just going to kind of spread it randomly across the lawn as evenly as I can. And then I'm going to start brushing it into all of these holes. All right, pardon the chickens back there. But now, you see I've got... Pretty even coverage. You got this light brown tinge to the entire lawn in this uh, space. Uh, so now I'm going to go brush it in and see if I can get as much of this into the cores that I pulled as possible. And then we're going to wait it out and see what it all looks like in a couple weeks. Oh my goodness. 
Don't let anybody kid you. This is hard work. I enjoy it though. Look at this. At this point, I can't see, at least through the camera, any, anything. All right, so here we are on the morning of March 30th. It's been, uh, what, a couple weeks or so since I did the core aerating and the, the top dressing on this area. And this is not a dramatic difference because I didn't actually top dress it with any uh, fertilizer. Um, there is obviously a little tiny bit of nitrogen in the earthworm castings. But you can see the line right here. Like, fairly dramatically. Over there is darker and it does look a little bit less dormant. Let's come over here into the light and see if we can see a line over here. The lighting might make this hard. Depending on the, the lighting angle, you can see the line right there, right along the sidewalk. It's less dramatic over here. and You've got to get the lighting just right to see it. No matter when you do this though, like this is the most important thing here. This takes far more time and energy than you realize to do it well. Anyone can poke a handful of cores through their lawn uh, and just call it a day. But to do it well, to get enough holes poked in the ground, it takes a long time and a lot of energy. You're gonna get blisters, you need to wear gloves, you're gonna have to take breaks, you're gonna have to do this over a few days, depending on the size of your yard, maybe a couple weeks. It is far easier to rent a mechanical aer aerator or hire a landscaping company or a lawn care company to come out and mechanically aerate your lawn for you. It does cost quite a bit to do it, but man, you can get it done far quicker. Now, I have also mechanically aerated my lawn. Now, here on my lawn, I do manual core aerate. In fact, here on the channel, I have an entire how-to guide on how to manually core aerate the lawn, but I also use liquid aeration products. The liquid aeration products work to soften the soil up. They don't relieve compaction, so to speak, like a core aerator, but they do soften the soil up. So that's an option for those edges if you don't want to take the manual route in those hard to reach spots. As you run the core aerator, it's important to flag and notate and make it very plainly obvious on the lawn where your sprinkler heads are. Because if you accidentally hit one, you're going to either damage the machine or, or the sprinkler head or both. You're certainly going to damage the sprinkler head you're probably gonna end up having to replace it. So if you mark those locations, it's a lot easier and safer to go around the areas and then manually core aerate around those uh, sensitive areas with a yard butler style tool. Now, in terms of gas and oil, these things are gonna be, be very similar to uh, large push behind lawnmowers. They're gonna use roughly the same amount of gas and oil. Not a lot is going to be different about that. In normal residential settings, you're only gonna be using a core aerator once or twice a year. So it doesn't usually make financial sense to spend the money to buy your own because on the low end, mechanical core aerators start somewhere around $1,500 and they can get quite pricey beyond that. If you're only using it twice a year, it just doesn't make sense. It makes far more sense to rent the machine. It makes much more sense to spend $1,000 on a really fancy lawnmower that you're going to be using once or twice a week over the course of a season. Now, if you're still planning your core aeration, there are a few things that you should be doing ahead of time. It's really important to water the lawn very deeply ahead of within a couple days of running the core aerator. I also like to spray liquid aerate product on the lawn to soften the soil up to make it a little bit easier for the tines to dig deeper into the ground and pull really good cores. It's also super important to fertilize the lawn a few days beforehand because getting fertilizer onto the lawn and then doing your deep water session is gonna push that fertilizer down into the root zone of the plant so the plant will be able to uptake it and get it into the plant system before the damage is inflicted by the aeration process. Now, a core aerator is going to be pretty damaging in the short term to your grass. 
as you can see right here, my grass is looking pretty rough right now. I've cut it much shorter than normal because it makes it easier to core aerate. And that is a little bit of a stressor on the grass itself. I've also run a dethatcher over it to get as much surface debris off of my lawn before running the core aerator as well. All of these things are pretty rough on the grass. Now, if we can get that fertilizer down in there and then core aerate, especially as we're pushing into fall or early spring, depending on the time of year that you're doing this, we're going to be feeding the grass and getting some nutrition back into that grass so that it can recover quickly, especially as we go into a high growth phase of both leaf tissue and root tissue of our grass systems. That happens for cool season grasses in early to mid spring and early fall. Those are the prime times for grass root development and grass leaf tissue growth. Now, after core aerating, which is what you see here, I've already core aerated, or at least I had it hired out. After doing this, you have the option of leaving all the cores here on the lawn, running them over with your lawnmower and just letting them slowly break down and reassimilate into the soil system. There is a good reason to do that. Most people will probably do that because they have longer grass than this and you're not even really going to notice it after a week or so. But for me, what I do is I rake all of this up and I take all of this material because I've actually got little small thatch layers on top of every single core. This is one of the benefits for me of doing this is it's a way to physically remove chunks of thatch. I can remove anywhere between 5 and 15% of my thatch layer in a single season by simply core aerating heavily or lightly once or twice a year. I want to get this off of the lawn because the thatch is very hard to break down once it gets too thick. Not only that, but I can take this material and use it as filler material for holes and many other lawn projects that I want to do around the property. Also, once I get it off the ground, I can then have a very clean surface with holes in the ground available to top dress my lawn with material that is hard to incorporate in the soil in any other circumstance. In the springtime, I top dress my lawn with peat moss and worm castings. Both the peat moss and the worm castings and a small top dusting of azomite went down onto the lawn and I was able to push broom it across the lawn and assimilate a lot of it into the cores that had been pulled. That is a very important step in increasing the health of my lawn without really properly fertilizing it. It just makes the lawn healthier. Those materials do better when they are deep in the soil system in the root zone and they're very hard to get there. Now, what's the difference between core aerating and liquid aerating? Both forms, whether you're using mechanical, manual, or, or liquid, all three forms, when you use these things, you are going to be allowing more moisture, more water to penetrate deeper into the lawn. Excellent idea. That is completely in line with many videos that I have produced on this channel where I have talked about watering your lawn deep and infrequently. We want that. The core aeration, whether it be manual or mechanical, is going to allow for air exchange, and it's going to bring some of the material to the sur surface. It's the cores that it brings to the surface. Now, some people bag those up, rake them up, and get rid of them, but it's good material, so I just think, why would you ever want to get rid of it? But this is going to, these core aerators are going to provide that air exchange. The liquid aerators are going to provide the stimulus for microbial life. That's going to improve the soil structure of the ground. Now, I think you see where I'm getting at here. I think it's not an either or. I really do think that this is important. I mean, I spent, I'm going to guess about $40 on this thing. Now I'm going to use this in various places, especially here in the hill, but I'm also going to use products like this because I want the actual biological activity to really get going on this hillside right here. That's the only way that I'm really going to take this hillside to the next level and turn it into the thriving yard that I want it to be. Now, in previous videos, I've talked about no cost, no product lawn repair. And I've talked about this hill and how mowing and watering is basically all you need. But that takes a lot of time. Now, if I want to stimulate biological life in the, in the soil, 
of this hillside, then these products are going to accelerate that process. It, they are completely not necessary. I would encourage you to watch my no cost lawn repair video if you have missed it. These things are not necessary, absolutely not necessary. Over time, your soil structure will continue to improve if you're tending to the, your uh, lawn properly and with purpose. Core aerating is going to help. These will speed the process up, but they are completely different, even though this is called an aerator and they call this aeration and they call this aeration. They're all different. In the spring, it's important to aerate the lawn if you haven't done it in the fall. Uh, however, if you're going to choose one time a year, the fall is the best time. In the spring, however, the best time in the spring, and that's what I'm going to be getting at in this video, is in the early spring. So if you have not aerated your lawn in the fall of the previous season and you're planning on doing an aeration project in the spring, whether you're using a manual like I've got right back there, or you're going to be renting something, or you're made of money and you're just going to be spending thousands on some big machine, the best time to do it in the spring is actually at the end of winter. The grass type that you have in your lawn is really kind of dictated by where you live. So if you live further south where the temperatures are warmer, you've got a warm season grass which thrives in warmer weather. So your end of winter is the same thing as the end of winter in a northern climate that's running a cold season grass. I, I have a cold season grass. Everybody's really kind of doing this at about the same time, unless you're in some zone where the grass never shuts down, maybe some sort of like coastal warm area or someplace extremely far south where nothing ever really shuts down. At the end of winter, the grass is still dormant, kind of like what you see back here. It's got just like touches of green, but mostly it's brown. Here, look up close at my lawn. Right now, there's bits of green in there and an awful lot of brown. Nothing's growing yet. Basically, all of that energy in that grass is still stored down in the root system. But soil temperatures are starting to climb as daytime temperatures are starting to climb and as the amount of light in the sky increases over and over and over, this is going to create more chlorophyll. It's just going to wake that plant up. So there is a benefit of doing it. The biggest benefit in the spring, however, is getting it done as early as possible. This video right here is part of my spring lawn care series. It's mostly preparation videos so that you can figure out how to take care of your lawn before spring has come. You need to be able to plan for spring so that you can be ahead of the ball so you can have the best lawn possible from the earliest stage of your season possible. If you're always playing catch up, then you're never going to get the lawn of your dreams. Right here, this lawn that you see right behind me is literally a January lawn at 4,200 feet in a northern climate. And this lawn that you see back here is a February lawn in a transition zone. I've been teaching people how to tend to their lawn for years now. I worked on cool season lawns and warm season lawns. I know probably too much about grass. If you wanna have a good looking lawn this spring or this fall, watch these two videos right up here in the corner. And for those of you who've made it to the end of this video, if you do wanna get some personalized advice, I do offer consultations. Links are in the description below.